Welcome to Office Hours. My name is Caroline Gohn. I'm one of the co-founders and the CEO of Leva League, which seeks to elevate women in their professional paths. And I'm here with none other than Warren Buffett, live from Omaha, Nebraska. Thank you so much for joining us. We're so thrilled to have 60 viewing parties around the United States and around the world tuning in, students, young professionals, all of you who are watching on everything from YouTube to Fast Company. We're so thrilled to have you, and we're so thrilled to take this next step in democratizing mentorship here today. It's really incredible what we can do with technology, the fact that we're having this conversation, we're going to be interacting with you. I have your questions in the live uh, Twitter stream um, on my iPad from Omaha, and we will be listening to what you want to, to hear Mr. Buffett talk about. We will be interacting here today, and we'll be engaging the conversation on Twitter at hashtag office hours and hashtag Warren Buffett. So please make sure to tune in and, um, and join the, the discussion that's happening. It is uh, s such an honor to be here with, um, with Warren today. He, as you know, is one of the best known investors and entrepreneurs of our time. And he's currently the chairman and CEO of Berkshire Hathaway Incorporated. Um, recently, he made headlines for being bullish on a surprising new investment, <laughs> women. And that's part of what we're here to talk about today. So he wrote in Fortune last week that we've seen what can be accomplished with 50% of the population. Imagine what can be accomplished with 100%. And we cannot wait to engage in that dialogue here today. We hope that you'll share what you learn on social media and that you'll continue to ask Warren questions here live so that we can make full use of this hour that we have with him. And um, let's get started. Let's do it. Without further ado, <laughs> okay. let's get started. So, so Warren, it's been a very big week for you. Yeah, we've been pretty busy, yeah. <laughs> so you, you've joined Twitter, you, recent, you recently you just finished your shareholders meeting, and you recently joined Leva League. I finally came out of my shell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so my first question to you is, why technology and, and why now? Why opening up this conversation now? Well, I probably should have done it earlier, but uh, actually when I read, uh, well, I've had 40 colleges and universities that come out every year. Uh, I always insist that at least a third of the participants from each school uh, be women. And I get a lot of questions uh, from both men and women about their careers and all sorts of things. Uh, so I had really talked about with these students what I wrote about in Fortune uh, mm -hmm. last week. Uh, but uh, I read it, The Galleys of uh, Lean In by Sheryl Sandberg. And, and it I just wrote down a few ideas that I had. I sent it to her. I thought it might work as a forward for that. Uh, it was things I'd been saying over the years. It didn't work as a forward there, but I decided that you know, it really was time to, to speak out on this. So uh, I sent it into Fortune, and, and they ran it. And, and then the social network type stuff, uh, which, you know, I, I'm, I'm back in the 19th century normally. <laughs> uh, uh, but it was a means of getting it more broadly distributed, and it, it, it seems to work very well. Absolutely, and we're thrilled that you're on Twitter and, and joining Leva. So yeah, the, the 20th you. century isn't so bad. Maybe I'll get to the 21st <laughs> one of these days. <laughs> I mean, you know, before we, we get into these questions, just you've really experienced over the course of your lifetime such a transition from, you know, women having one specific role in society and even technology having one specific role in society to where we are today. Do you want to just paint a, paint a picture, give a little bit of color to what the world was like when you were growing up and what it's like today and, and some, of the, some of the things that you've seen change? Yeah, it's really true, uh, Caroline. I, I was born in 1930. I had an older sister, Doris, a few years older, a younger sister, Bertie, a couple years uh, younger. And they're absolutely as smart as I am probably a little smarter and, and uh, much more personable. <laughs> they, they, they got along better in the world and all of that. My parents, our parents, loved us all equally. They never told my sisters, you can't do this or you can't do that, verbally. But every message they got from society, from their teachers in every way, was that their job was to marry well or if they insisted on working, that they could be a secretary or a nurse or a teacher. and, and uh, and essentially, they were telling me, again, silently in many ways, that the sky was the limit. So we would go to school, and we'd get similar grades. Uh, they would be very popular. I mean, they had everything going for them, except for the fact that they were women. Right. And here in 1776, we said, you know, these truths are self-evident, you know, that all men are created equal. 
Well, they must have had their fingers crossed because, you know, the Constitution came out. Uh, it was drafted um, 11 years later, and, and it used a whole bunch of uh, male pronouns in Article 2 describing the presidency. And, and we went for decade after decade after decade not using women. And imagine if, if we'd said that all the, all the males under 5 foot 10 could only work in three occupations. It would be crazy, wouldn't it? Right. But it's just as nutty, in my view, <laughs> to say half the population because of their female. I mean, the, the talent is there, but they, they, uh, the society just said, you know, if you want to be a teacher, fine. If you want to be a nurse, fine. If you want to be a, a secretary, fine, but forget everything else. Mm -hmm. So I have seen that change in my lifetime, although was, change was slow. I mean, we, you know, we had, the, uh, we had the 19th Amendment passed in 1920, and as I point out in my article, the next 33 appointments to the Supreme Court were men, and the odds mm -hmm. of that being by chance were 8 billion to 1. I mean, so now, part of that was just inertia, part of it was that attitudes dropped slowly, but uh, part of it was that <laughs> men liked it the way it was. <laughs> uh, but it has changed a lot for the better. There's, a, there's still important ways to go, but uh, my business class at Columbia uh, in 1951 had one woman in it, you know, and uh, yeah. I mean, it was just, it was a joke. Uh, that, it's, that's changing. But I also said I've seen, I've seen this with males too, but I've seen very, very bright women. I used the example of Catherine Graham, who was yes. outstanding. Uh, while she was CEO of the Washington Post, the stock went up 40 for one. She won a Pulitzer Prize. But she'd been told by her mother, she'd been told by her husband, she'd been told by lots of people that women were as good as, as men in business. It was nonsense. And I kept telling her, you know, quit looking at that funhouse mirror. You know, here's a real mirror. You're, you're something. And as smart as she was, as high grade as she was, you know, as, as, as famous as she became, right to her dying day, you know, she had that little voice inside her that kept repeating what her mother told her a long time ago. So everybody should get a chance to live up to their potential. And women should not hold themselves back, and nobody should hold them back. And that's my message. <laughs> I love that. And it's so interesting because we recently had an office hours with Sheryl Sandberg, um, as you know, and one of the things that she talked about was this little voice that you're referring to. Yeah. And the fact that for whatever reason, women in particular grow up with this voice and you can call it guilt, you can call it self-doubt, you can call it whatever you want, yeah. but it, it, it exists and it doesn't really go away. But I think having these conversations about the fact that it is um, a distortion of reality. It is part of what contributes to the funhouse mirror. That can at least help us understand that it's that it's societally created and that it's something that we don't have to just accept. Yeah, there, it, everybody. I mean, the potential of humans is, is we haven't come close to scratching it even. You know, and Absolutely. And, and, and look what's happened since 1776. Most of the time, using half our talent. I mean, just imagine what's going to happen when we you know go full with blast with 100 percent and and. You know, it's, it's incumbent on everybody to try and help people, uh, particularly if you're in a, a boss's type position, mm -hmm. to help the people achieve their potential. And uh, women have every bit the potential men do. <laughs> can, you, can you talk a little bit more about what, so, so your call to action is extremely powerful, especially given your role as, as a male leader. Can you talk a little bit more about how two types of men can really engage in supporting women in this transition? The first type of male is the leader, right? The CEO of a company, the um, entrepreneur, the person making hiring decisions, the person making board decisions, um, and the person making any sort of personnel related yeah. decision. And the second group I'd be really interested um, in hearing your thoughts on, it, you know, the second group consists of male peers, mm -hmm. right? So, th so the people who are rising in the cohort alongside their you know, yeah. fellow women. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about what your recommendations would be to, to those different types of men and, and how they can really take your essay and as a call to action? Yeah, well, for the leader, you, you, you have to, you know, you, you have to take away the funhouse mirror and, and uh, uh, you have to realize that talent is scarce and you better take it wherever you can get it. I, right. You know, I, I, it'd be silly. I, well, just go back again to my example with males. I mean, let's just assume that I had some bias against males, five, ten, or less, or something. I wouldn't hire them. I wouldn't. I wouldn't promote them. I mean, th that's just plain foolish. And and uh, when it comes to boards, I can tell you that that uh, uh, the women we put on our board, uh, they 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 know business. Uh, they know people. Mm -hmm. They know how to make decisions. They understand uh, the ownership 
the, the shareholders or their partners and all. We've got all the qualities we want. At, uh, uh, and I would say, to a, there was not a lot of malicious intent in Oberlin. It right. just became very natural. I mean, right. it, it, it just wasn't in the consciousness of, of, of a lot of leaders. I think it's coming along mm -hmm. well on that. Uh, uh, when you get to peers, you always have to wonder whether in a competitive situation you don't. Right. <laughs> you wish you only had to compete with half the people <laughs> instead of 100 percent of the people. I mean, it would. If, if, if I, I'm not sure how I would do if I was a male and I was I had I had two people to compete with, I could get rid of one of them because she was a woman, <laughs> or one of the guys because he was a redhead or some crazy reason right. like that. But uh, you know, it is it is fun. It's enormous fun for me when I find somebody that starts and really doesn't realize how good they can be. Mm -hmm. Kay was that way. Kay Graham, she really didn't. She, she kept telling herself that she put limitations on herself. She was a superstar. I mean, when she wrote her autobiography, I mean, it was going to win a Pulitzer Prize. Right. And she wrote it. And incidentally, the person that helped her was a woman. <laughs> and uh, it is a marvelous book. But all the time, fighting that, that mm -hmm. self-doubt. So I, I think you should encourage anybody, male or female, uh, to reach their potential. I mean, I wouldn't just limit it to females. I mean, it, right. it, it, anybody you can help reach their potential you know, you've given a gift that's very, very important. That's great. And, and one, one point I'd love to touch on before we um, move on with these questions that are filling my screen right now um, is, can you give our viewers a sense of what the technology landscape looked like when you were growing up? Like, what did you, what did a, a day in the life of Warren Buffett look like in the first 10 years of your career? And then what does it look like today? Well. I got very interested. I, I was lucky. I found out what I, I liked doing when I was very mm -hmm. young. So I got interested in investments. Uh, but the way I learned about investments then uh, was to go to the Alma Public Library. I read every book on investments by the time I was 11. But, uh, mm -hmm. but when I wanted to learn more about specific companies as I became a professional and when I was, after I got out of school, was I would mail away for reports and they would take a week to come, you know, or I'd mail to the SEC and they'd send me these little microfiche type of copies. Or, Today, or if I write my annual report now, and I want to look up and find out how many justices were appointed at the Supreme Court before, uh, after the, <laughs> the 19th Amendment, before Sandra Day O'Connor, you know, I would, I would have had to go to the library and dig around and everything. I can find it out in about two minutes now. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 so having all this information, you know, is, is, is just plain uh, wonderful. Uh, uh, I'm not very good at tech yet, though, so don't give me any quizzes. <laughs> <I will not. laughs> we're getting, we're getting there. <laughs> And one thing that um, you know our users are really curious about is your working style. So you, you know, we know anecdotally from some of the people who work with you, you take a lot of care in cultivating your personal relationships. You've had long-standing partnerships. Um, you, you know, you've really invested in the the city that you live in in your home. And tell us a little bit about how your philosophy towards people. Has developed and and how you think about partnerships and relationships. Yeah, well, Caroline, I you know I run a company that has 24 people in the home office here in Omaha, and we have 285,000 people working for us. We have we probably have 50 CEOs that, that report to me. Well, obviously we can't run anything from headquarters, and I don't want to run anything. I I, I like I do not want to have hundreds of people here and have to <laughs> think about everything that goes with it. So. So I have delegated like nobody's ever delegated with a company of this size. And I trust the managers, and, mm -hmm. and uh, most of them are already rich. We buy their companies for hundreds of millions or billions of dollars. We don't get contracts with them to keep working. I mean, they have to go to work every day because they want to go to work, not because there's some contract or because they need the money. So I try to create the conditions that uh, will cause them to really rather be at work than on some yacht someplace, which they could easily afford. And I say to myself, uh, you know, how do you get people that don't need to work to work? Well, you give them something that they love to work on. Right. And, you know, I don't need to work, but I jump out of bed every morning. I'm excited. I come to the office because I think I'm painting this painting, which is Berkshire Hathaway. And it, the canvas is of unlimited size. And I get to paint. And I get to paint the way I want to paint. And I do that. I feel the same thing works for our managers. And, you know, every now and then you have a disappointment. But overwhelmingly, mm -hmm. if you put trust in that, uh, uh, in, in the equation with people that have already shown they have a lot of ability running their business, 
And it's real trust, and they don't report to committees at headquarters or do anything like that. We've never had a committee meeting. But we don't have any committees. So how could we have one? <laughs> uh, and, and overwhelmingly, those people do a good job, and then they deserve appreciation when mm -hmm. they do it. Uh, I like applause, you know, and if I like applause, you know, I'm sure they like applause. And what they really like is is intelligent applause from a, from, from a real critic. And, you know, they, they get that when they get that from me. And, and in terms of, you know, people working with, I, my partner is a fellow named Charlie Marker in Los mm -hmm. Angeles. We started working together 54 years ago. Wow. We are very strong-minded. We often disagree. We have never in our lives had an argument with each other, and we never will. It just doesn't happen. I mean, he's a wonderful partner. You know, he always gives me credit for more than I'm doing. And, you know, <laughs> if, it, if, his, if he has an idea and it's a good one, he says it's my idea. And if it's a bad one, he says it was his idea. He's just, he's just a perfect partner. And uh, uh, totally, I mean, we, we challenge each other and all of that. But uh, it's a lot more fun accomplishing things in life with a partner, frankly, than, than by yourself. Mm -hmm. And that gets to um, you know the whole the whole context of community building. And one of the big messages that we that we really advocate for at Levo is the importance of creating a community around you of mentors and of peers who help you succeed, help you along that path. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about? And, and you know, you started to discuss this obviously in the context of your mentorship relationship with Kay um, in your essay. But can you can you talk to us a little bit about um, maybe some of the unsung heroes in your life? Maybe some of the people who've influenced you or supported you, but who, who haven't been as visible as um, as others that we that we may have already talked about. Well, Caroline, I mean, I, if you tell me who your heroes are, I'll tell you how you're going to turn out. I mean, it's really important in life to have the right heroes and. And I've been very lucky in that, you know, I've probably had a dozen or so major heroes, and uh, none of them has ever let me down. I mean, and, and, and you really, <coughs> you want to hang around with people who are better than you are. <laughs> that, <laughs> Absolutely. That, you know, that, you, will, you will. You will move in the direction of the crowd, and, you know, that, that you associate with. So, I've, fortunately, I've had these heroes starting with my dad, but uh, uh, my wife, my first wife, uh, uh, she, I was a mess when I met her, but she, she did all kinds of things for me. I mean, no, I'm, I'm not kidding. I mean, I, I would be an entirely different person if I hadn't married her. It's a very important to marry well. Uh, <coughs> you know, I had this wonderful teacher, Ben Graham. I've had mm -hmm. other teachers like my friend Tom Murphy that's on the board of Berkshire. Uh, a fellow named Joe Rosenfield in, 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 uh, in, in Des Moines. But you mentioned me being a mentor to Kay. Kay was a mentor to me, too. I mean, she taught me a lot at... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so if, if you get to associate with people that are really first-class people, uh, it, you know, that's the real benefit, and, and, and you should aspire to do that. Uh, you want to have the right heroes. Absolutely. We, um, we started to talk a little bit about, about lifestyle in the sense that, you know, you talk a lot about the fact that some of the CEOs that you manage, they, they could be sure. sitting on a yacht somewhere, they they want. but instead yeah. they're dedicating themselves to, to growing their canvas, to painting their canvas. Um, what do you really, what is, what is important to you from a work and life integration perspective? Yeah. This well, is a big question. Yeah, right <laughs> well, I, 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 I love painting on my canvas. I'll always love it. I always have loved it. I mean, right. and you're lucky in life if you can find your passion. I tell those students, you know, uh, you may have to take a job or two, you, you, know, you, got, you got to eat, but never give up searching for the job that's your passion. Try to find the job that you would have if you were independently rich. That's the job I have. And when you find that job, the job that causes you to be excited every day and forget about the pay, uh, and where you associate with people you love doing what you love, it doesn't get any better than that. My partner Charlie is 89, and we were talking about that this weekend. You know, I'm 82, he's 89. We do what we love every day with mm -hmm. people we love, you know, and they seem to like us okay. So, <laughs> it, it, you know, it, it, how can it be any better? And just cost of living does not equate the standard of living. And the standard of living is, you know, achieving what you want to achieve, working with people that you love. And you don't need that much money. Aside, right. I love to ride around in a private plane. I will totally acknowledge that. Leave it. <laughs> Leaving that out, you know, I basically, you know, leaving out taxes and charity and things like that, I can live on easily live on a hundred thousand dollars a year, mm -hmm. and, and it, and I wouldn't live, I wouldn't live better if I had eight houses, if I had, you know, a four hundred foot yacht or anything of the sort. I've, I've been on four hundred foot yachts and I've been in a lot of fancy houses, 
but I'm in a house that I bought 55 years ago. It's warm in the winter, it's cool in the summer, it has everything I wanted, plus it has all kinds of good memories. You know, right. my, my kids have good thoughts about it. I can't imagine living any better. I paid $31,500 for it. I could pay $31 million for a house, and, and it, wouldn't, it wouldn't do for me what this present house does. What, we have a question from Carlton in Philadelphia. And she asks, at what moment did you know that you were on the right track? So when did you identify that you were, that you had found that passion, that, that you were painting the canvas, that you wanted yeah. to continue painting? Well, that's where I was lucky, because I did stumble into the, the fact. Uh, my, my dad had a small brokerage firm, and mm -hmm. I would go down on Saturday morning and to go to lunch with him, and it was a big deal. But in the morning when he worked, I would read the books there. And, and so I found it very early. And not everybody does that. That's just plain uh, luck when that uh, Happened. So I always knew the path I wanted to follow, mm -hmm. and uh, I was I was intellectually okay with it from the start. But I got messed up to some extent when we moved from Omaha to Washington. I didn't adjust very well, and my grades were terrible. All kinds of things. So I got very off the track, and it 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 took a well. My my wife, uh, you know, basically said she just had to have this little watering can that she sprinkled on me, and finally, finally the flowers bloomed, but it, it took a while, and, and I was very fortunate. <laughs> um, one, one, of our, one of our members is actually asking as a follow-up question, um, this is Casey from Texas. She's asking, um, can you remember a specific time in your life when you had the most difficulty adjusting to your career path, and, um, and, and, and it sounds like maybe that was your move um, to Washington, but can you sort of inspire our audience with an example of a time when you may have doubted your career path, and how did you how did you move move out of that into where you are today? I really didn't doubt my career path, but uh, I, I I was not functioning well. Uh, mm -hmm. I, it was, it was, I was okay in some respects, but not in other respects. And uh, I I was terrified, for example, both in high school and college. I don't know when it started. Uh, but I became terrified of public speaking, and uh, I just couldn't do it. I mean, I, I, and so I arranged all my classes so I never had to <laughs> do any public speaking. <laughs> and I got to Columbia, and I saw an ad in the paper uh, for Dale Carnegie course, and I went down. It was somewhere in the mid forties, and I gave the guy a check for a hundred dollars, and I went back and stopped payment. I lost my nerve, <laughs> and then I came out. I got out of Columbia actually when I was twenty, and I came out to start selling securities in Omaha, and I realized. I had to get up and be able to get up in front of people. I couldn't go through life this way. So I saw an ad again in the uh, local paper that there was a Dale Carnegie course being given. I went down and I gave the fellow $100 in cash. And I became associated with 30 other people in the class. We couldn't stand up in front of a group and say our own name. I mean, it was, we were, it was pathetic. But that class changed my life in a big way. Wow. As a matter of fact, they used to give a pencil every week for whoever did the most with what they learned the previous week. And during that class, I proposed to my wife, and she accepted, and I won the pencil that week. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's important. I mean, there's certain, you've got to be able to communicate in life. Right. And it's enormously important. And probably the schools, to some extent, underemphasize that. I mean, you can mm -hmm. start going for an MBA, and people think it's kind of beneath them to teach you about communication. But if you, if you can't communicate, if you can't, talk to other people and get across your ideas or write, you, you know, you're, you're giving up your potential. And, uh, you know, anybody that's got a career potential of X, I, I guarantee it'll be 150% of X if they, uh, if they really learn how to communicate well. So that was, that was a big mm -hmm. a part of really succeeding in my career, you know, when you, when you get right down to it. And then I was fortunate enough to pick up a book when I was 19 by a great teacher, Benjamin Graham. And, and, uh, he taught me a lot about investments, but it was really my dad and my wife that taught me about life. So is your number one, so multiple people, including um, Devin here from Charleston, asked, what's the one piece of advice you would give to a fellow introvert? And we talked a little bit before <laughs> yeah. this about the fact that this is not in our comfort, either of our comfort no. zone no. as fellow introverts. <laughs> yeah. So would your, would your advice to a fellow introvert be to just sort of confront that fear, go to a communication class, and just practice out of the fear? You have to do it. I mean, I, 
you, you have to do it. And, and, and the sooner you do it, the better. I mean, it, it's so much easier to get the right habits when you're young than, right. than work later on. And I mean, I think they have Toastmaster clubs. I don't know what they all are, but if, they, <laughs> if, if, they're, if they're, you know, it, uh, to get over fear of associating with people, you got to go out there and associate. And, and uh, uh, it's painful. Mm -hmm. It's very painful. When I finished the Dale Carnegie course, now I'm 21, proposed, got accepted and everything, <laughs> but I was very worried that I would lapse back like I was before. So I actually went up to the University of Omaha and I just, I want to teach. Mm -hmm. and, I, uh, and, and fortunately they, they, they accepted me. So I started teaching a class at night uh, when I was, I believe, 21. And, wow. and, and you know, you, you've got to do, you know, you've got to force yourself sometimes to do things. And I know it isn't easy because it wasn't easy for, <laughs> it wasn't easy for me. When I started selling securities, I was, well, I was 20 when I started selling securities, and I would go out, and I used to walk around downtown Omaha and call on people, and there were people that, that I knew weren't going to be that friendly sometimes, and I'd walk around the block three or four times sometimes before I'd walk in. <laughs> Work up the nerves Absol to get in there. Absolutely. You know, you, you know it's, it's, it's not a bad thing to take a job as a salesperson. Mm -hmm. Just to interact with people. I used to sell shirts at J.C. Penney Company. You know, I'd, uh, I sold men's suits, I sold children's clothing. And if, if, if you are somewhat introverted, like you say you are, and I know I am, uh, just getting out there and forcing yourself to get into a situation where you talk with people, most of them don't bite. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, you've been, you've been a, in a teaching role and you've been in a student role and what would you say this is a question that we're receiving from Carly what would you say is um, one thing that you feel that the American educational system can do a better job of equipping our young people with well the biggest I mean the job of, of teachers is to enable the students to reach their potential mm -hmm. and and uh, you know a great teacher we I've got a program that I don't know for 25 years we we uh, give awards to students that are nominated as great teachers, 15 of them every year. I mean, a great teacher, uh, it's, it's, it's a gift, you know. And, and, and uh, uh, in A Man for All Seasons, uh, uh, somebody comes to Sir Thomas More and says, what should I do? And he said, uh, you should become a teacher. And, uh, and the young man says, why? Uh, nobody will ever know. And, and uh, the fellow says, uh, Sir Thomas More says, uh, no, that's not correct. He says, uh, uh, you're, you'll know, your students will know, and God will know. He said, not a bad audience. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. Actually, Danielle from, from Canton, Ohio, is asking, what are you currently reading? What's on your book stand right well, now? Well, <laughs> my book stand has about 100 books piled up. I, I, I love to read. Uh, I don't read as fast as I used to, but I've always loved to read. And, and I like to read biographies. I just read the... Uh, the book, uh, The Patriarch, about Joe Kennedy, for example. Mm -hmm. I, I love reading biographies. I, I, if, if you get one message from our talk today, read Catherine Graham's personal history. It's okay. a remarkable story. It's about a woman who lived an incredibly interesting life in all these positions. I mean, she was seeing the world, a very interesting world from the most interesting perch. And the, interesting, the amazing thing about it, it's totally honest. It's a totally honest book. When I read the galleys of that book, I called her after I read it, and I said, I've got just two things to say to you, Kay. I said, you wrote the book, I hoped you'd write. And then oh, I wow. said, I'm never going to try and write a book because <laughs> yours, yours is too honest. I said, in my book, I want to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. You know, I, I am not capable of writing an honest <laughs> book, so, so you set a standard I can't meet. <laughs> That's great. Um, so, so Katie Larkin Wong um, from San Francisco, um, she's actually leading a viewing party at Latham Watkins right now. Um, hi, Katie. How are you? <laughs> hi. She asked, um, you know, you, you've really become a proponent of, of you know, female to male and male to female mentorship. And, you know, you're share, you shared the story about Kay um, that you wrote about um, so eloquently and, and so um, compassionately. And, you know, what advice would you give to young women who are seeking male mentors? And um, what advice would you give um, to, to men who are in positions where they, they would like to help young, young women succeed as mentees? Yeah, well, I, I, um, I never really thought, of, I mean, these, these relationships all just evolve. I mean, I mm -hmm. didn't set out to become a mentor or anybody, <laughs> and, 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 but I have plenty, you know, that helped me. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it, it's amazing 
I didn't realize this when I was in school, but it's, it's really amazing how the person that really wants to do a terrific job, you know, mm -hmm. and arrives a little early and does a little extra work, they just jump out. There aren't that many. So, so you will be perceived as exceptional and as a, uh, a worthy, you know, a person for a superior to spend some extra time with if you just do something extra all the time. That, right. uh, you know, don't be five minutes late, be five minutes early. All, <laughs> all, all of this Ben Franklin stuff, you know, I mean, it, it seems very elementary. Right. But it's true. It's true. I mean, at, uh, I notice, well, I, I hired a young woman uh, three years ago. We have practically no hire. We don't hire at Berkshire. I mean, very rare. And she had just jumped out at me to some extent. She ran something called Smart Women's Securities with another woman. And, and she clearly, you know, she had the stuff. Mm -hmm. And and at first I couldn't I couldn't even figure out a job for her and then and right. she, she actually came from a farm in Kansas so she started bring, bring me corn and tomatoes <laughs> <laughs> she knew I liked to eat corn so and, bring your mentor yeah, yeah she, you got to just you got to in a very nice way sort of push yourself a little bit forward and and make it make it clear that you know you're worth spending some time with I mean right. you, you know I mean who should you spend your time with you want to spend it with with somebody that's that's going to get something out of it and and you want to enjoy it. Uh, uh, so there, there are ways to, to get your hand up, you know, and, and uh, I, I think actually Cheryl writes that the book. I mean, the, and actually Tracy told me that she went to Harvard Business School, and the women just didn't raise their hand as often mm -hmm. as the men. You know, I, I raised my hand all the time, you know, and, right. <laughs> when I didn't even deserve to. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, and you want to get over the idea, as I wrote the article, you know, the males, there's a lot of Wizard of Oz in us. I mean, you know, you get behind the curtain and you find out that it isn't quite that imposing. <laughs> Um, well, I, you know, what other, so, so Ari um, from Atlanta is asking, you know, what other habits did you cultivate? So, so you're talking a little bit about um, this woman that you hired that really stood out to you and impressed you um, in, in, her, in her 20s, in her 30s. What other habits did you cultivate in your 20s, in your 30s that you now see as being foundational to your success as a business person? Yeah, well, I, I knew a lot about what I do. Uh, when I was 20. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, I really read a lot, and, and uh, I aspired to learn everything that I could about the subject. So intellectually, I knew a lot. I did not know a lot about human behavior. I mean, that, that you can't learn really out of reading books, but it's, it's very important to understand people. And uh, I say to the students, you know, just imagine you could buy or you, or you could be given 10% of the future earnings of one person that you know among everybody you know. Now, are you going to pick the person that's the smartest? Are you going to pick the person that can dance the best or that can run the fastest or anything like that? That's the right height? No, or anything. No, no. <laughs> you're, going to, you're going to pick the person that has the right habits, that, that is cheerful, generous, gives other people credit for what they do. You know. And when you look at all of the qualities that you admire in other people, mm -hmm. which would cause you to pick that person, say to yourself, which of those qualities can't I have myself? Because they are, you know, you determine whether you have them. So just write them down on a piece of paper. What, who is the person that you admire the most or like the best? Why do I like them? And just write down and then say, which of these can I do myself? And the truth is right. you can do them. And then you also, if you really want to carry it to the next extreme, you pick the person you dislike the most. And why do you dislike that person? You know, and, and you know they always—they're never fair about things. Basically, they always claim more credit than they're due and everything. And write down those qualities, and say if you dislike that in some other person, why in the world right. would you want to have those yourself? So you just get rid of those, and it's—it's it's a pretty simple thing to do. But you want to be the person that if you could pick your best friend, you know, that, that you would have the same qualities. Wow, that's that's really. Mm -hmm. Um, and th I think that's a new approach to to this concept of um, professional development that I'm sure our yeah. our members are really enjoying right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. One you, question: You can't change your you you can't change your IQ. You can't right. change how high you can jump or all of those things. But if you look around the world at the people that succeed and mm -hmm. the people that other people want to work with, the natural leaders. It isn't because they have the highest IQ or they can kick a football the furthest or anything like that. Right. They're, they're people that you want to work with. I mean, I've got a wonderful friend named Tom Murphy. I know 
I would do anything for him. You know, he's never going to ask me to do it, but I mean, I want to. <laughs> but I want to do it. I mean, I, I want to do it. I mean, he's done so many things for me, and then, and you know, I, you know, he didn't have to pay me to do it or anything of the sort. That, 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 that that's what you want to. You want to look for that, and, and you want to be that. Who is one person who you have met recently who's really impressed you, and what about them um, really stuck out to you? Uh, well, it's, it's interesting. I'm going to meet Chelsea Clinton in about a week, and I'll bet I'll bet I will give that, I'll bet after I meet <laughs> we'll her, I give her that, that answer. Yeah, I'll, I'll predict that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, I uh, that, that's a good question. Obviously, I've hired mm -hmm. now these three people in the office, and they, they must have really impressed me. Or when, you know, because we don't. We don't hire very do that. that. No, right. no. And um, one fun question that's come from Twitter is, if you could pick one person, um, you know, living or not, to have dinner with, you know, tomorrow, who would you choose and why? Well, it would be my dad and my wife. Yeah. That's great. All righty. So we're going to move to um, a little more of a discussion around um, leadership, success, and entrepreneurship. So... Aaron from Los Angeles is asking, you know, what are you most concerned about and what are you most excited about for future generations of young people as they ascend into the professional world? Well, the future is terrific. I mean, and, and I would love to be a child being born today, particularly in the United States. It, it, mm -hmm. It's so much better. And I mean, just think how much better it would have been for my sisters if they'd been born today or been born 10 years ago than, than being born around 1930. Uh, uh, so, you know, the, the, there's, the potential is absolutely terrific. The thing we have to worry about over, the only thing really to worry about, you have to worry about economic things in this country. I mean, this country's going to move forward just like it has. In, in my lifetime, the real GDP per capita has gone up six for one. Wow. You know, th there's nothing like that in the history of the world. We have to worry uh, uh, and really, it has to be done through our leaders, but about nuclear, chemical, and biological, uh, uh, the, the spread of the knowledge of that into the hands of people mm -hmm. that wish evil on, may, on, on their neighbor one way or another, because the ability to inflict harm on others has increased exponentially ever since the atom bomb in 1945. And uh, there are a lot of psychotics and, 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 and sociopaths and mm -hmm. people out there. And if you go back a few thousand years, all you could do is throw a stone at the guy in the next cave. But now you can, you can do a lot of damage. Right. And that is, that's the cloud always on the horizon. But other than in the economic sphere, you know, in medicine, education, all kinds of things, the potential is we just started. <laughs> right, absolutely. We're, you know, we talk a lot about the fact that we, we are very fortunate to have been alive during this period of complete information transformation and technological transformation. And, oh, um, you it's, know, it's unbelievable. Right. I mean, I mean in, in the last 15 or 20 years, I mean, the things I can do now right. that I couldn't do 15 or 20 years ago, I'm, it, uh, it's incredible. Uh, it, uh, uh, just in, in gathering information, but also in... in I, I play bridge on the computer, mm -hmm. you know, a dozen hours a week, and and I have so much fun doing that. And you know, I can arrange a game in you know thirty seconds. And it used to be I had to call people and they'd get them together. Right. And it, it's a wonderful world. <laughs> Who is your favorite bridge partner? Well, I, my my favorite bridge partner is, is Sharon Osberg, who lives in San Francisco. She, she's a uh, two times world champ and I'm two times world chump uh, but we may we have a lot of fun together playing and and she's been great I mean we started playing together 20 years ago and it's because of the computer I can play with her obviously if she's in San Francisco right. and, and bridge is a partnership game I mean it, it, it's almost like dancing you know mm -hmm. intellectually because you really uh, have to be in tune with the person you're playing with and you have to bring out the best in them and they have to bring out the best in you and not all couples achieve that. Right. <laughs> we, uh, Sharon and I like to play against married couples sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> when they get mad at each other, they stay mad. <laughs> and they do foolish things. <laughs> so my, um, my parents have been trying to convince me to learn bridge for about 25 years. So I am now officially converted. I, you know, if Warren Buffett would like, <laughs> thinks that bridge is a valuable intellectual exercise and partnership exercise, done. I will now commit Terrific. to playing you'll be, bridge. You'll be good, too. <laughs> Thank you. And I will return to Omaha and, and challenge you. Good. Um. <laughs> good. good. I'm not going to play you for money. You're too, you look tough. <laughs>
Um, so what do you, um, so people are reacting so quickly. So, so Shocker from New York just asked, you know, speaking of habits and speaking of games like Bridge, um, what, what other daily habits do you have and which ones do you find to be the most rewarding? Well, I, I am really a creature of habit, but I, I, I read at least five hours, probably six, uh, probably six hours a day. And wow. I, I, I just like to read. Now, I, I, a lot of it ties in with, with the business I do, uh, but I enjoy it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be doing it otherwise. I mean, if I'd rather be out on a yacht or you know, out playing golf all the time, I'd do that. But I, I, I just love getting more information, and, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and I like building Berkshire. It is, it is my, my, my canvas. So uh, I spend a lot of time doing that. I play some bridge. Uh, I talk to my friends, and, and, and I pretty much don't do anything I don't like to do. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm very fortunate in that. I mean, I really, I really don't have to uh, uh, do almost anything. I mean, right. you know, I, don't, uh, I, I would not like to be president of certain organizations because there's so many obligatory duties, you know, lots of speeches or something of that sort. And uh, I am pretty much in command of my own time, and you can say, well, it's kind of a crazy way to spend it, you know, mm -hmm. but I have a lot of fun doing it. <laughs> One question that we've received from Twitter is um, around the cultivation of time. Being, learning how to say no That's is, is equally important to learning how to say yes when, when managing your own time in your life. Absolutely. Can you help us understand how to, cultiva how to cultivate that um, mindset of, of being comfortable saying no, being comfortable delegating? This is something that we found with our members is especially difficult for young women. It's tough. Um, and, and we'd love to just hear your take yeah. on that and maybe any advice you have to share about that. I met Bill Gates, Bill Gates in 1991, and when I did it, we had a great time talking. Uh, he thought he was going to hate it, and I, I, I wasn't too keen on it either. And about 10 <laughs> hours later, we were still talking. But what really got him is when I pulled out this little date book. I'm probably the only guy in the United States with one of these still. What, oh, no, I have that. one over there. <laughs> <laughs> and I just flipped through it, and, you know, there's, there's practically nothing in it. And Bill was really impressed by that. And uh, uh, you've got to keep control of your time. And, and you won't con keep control of your time unless you can say no. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you can't let other people set your agenda in life. And of course, I know I'm in a very fortunate position on that because I can, I, and in another way, I'm not so fortunate because more people ask me for things. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 they're, and they're usually friends and they say, well, can't you just make this one talk or right. attend this one graduation or whatever it may be. Uh, you know, you, you've got to, you just have to develop the ability to say no and, and, and uh, do it a few times. Uh, I mean, you know, if a woman can't say no, she's in trouble, right? Right. <laughs> right. And I mean, is this something that becomes easier over time, or how did you? I don't think it gets a lot easier. No, it is. It's there's a couple. There's a few things that really just are uncomfortable enough. I, the thing I like, the, the thing I dislike the most, mm -hmm. the, the only thing I really dislike in connection with my job, is if I have to fire somebody. I mean, that does not get easy for right. that, that easier for me as, as life has gone along. And saying no is not like firing people, but it's got a little bit of the same aspect to it. it right. It's not easy to say no, particularly to a friend. Uh, but I will have every day th three or four or five requests to do something, and I, I can't do them all, you know. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm, But I'm not promising it gets easier. <laughs> 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 but but just keep doing it. Uh, right. Otherwise, uh, other people will be running your life. I, I think, um, so, so you referred to, you know, the, hiring and firing and just kind of going back to um, some of the more important discussions that have to have have to happen in the context of an effective business um, Shannon in particular from Florida is asking you know what tips do you have on how to really negotiate your worth in the workplace um, whether it's negotiate your salary we had equal payday recently yeah. and that's something that you know we really worked to um, to teach our members how to do like what, what advice do you have well that, that was that was one of the interesting things in because in uh, in Cheryl's book she talked about uh, when she went home and sort of was going to take the first offer someplace and her husband told her you know you're crazy to take the first offer you ought to negotiate I've actually had a little different experience in life uh, I wanted to go to work for my hero, Ben Graham, after I got out of school, and he said right. no, and I came out here and worked for a few years. In 1954, he said, Warren, next time you're in, all, in New York, I'd, I'd like to talk to you, and I, I sort of figured it was going to be a job opportunity, so I was there the next day, <laughs> practically, and, <laughs> and he said, yeah, we, we'd like you to come to work for us. I never asked the salary. It just, I just, I took the job. I mean, I knew he was going to be a fair person, and 
I did not know my salary until I got my first paycheck. We'd moved to New York with wow. a baby and one on the way, and I'd gotten an apartment, and I found out what I was earning at the end of that time. I don't really, I do very little negotiation, uh, negotiating with people, and and they do little with me in terms of it. And uh, I, uh, Cheryl, you know, said that, and, and if it was, maybe if I was a woman, it'd be different because they might be treating me unfairly. Right. But I, I don't think when you find who you want to work for and what you want to do, uh, I, I, I don't really, I, I wouldn't believe in negotiating much. Although, I, like I say, if I, I was a woman, I thought I was getting paid considerably less than somebody else that was equal coming in. That would bother me a lot. I probably wouldn't even want to work there. I mean, I'd probably mm -hmm. want to, uh, somebody's going to be unfair with you. Uh, in salary, they're probably going to be unfair with you in a hundred other ways. So I, right. I, I disagree a little with Cheryl on that. And and one of you know we are we have about ten minutes left, so I'm going to you know give you about two two or three more questions from our audience here. Okay. Right. And um, we have a question here from um, a young lady named Nancy who is writing to us from Entrepreneur Magazine. Mm -hmm. And she has a question about entrepreneurship. And you know obviously your path is a very successful entrepreneur. She would love to understand from you um, if success is contingent on a good plan, excellent educa um, you know, education and execution, and a driven mindset, what do you think makes businesses fall apart um, when all of these factors have been met? Well, and con yeah. Sorry, some, business, go ahead. some businesses are just tough. I mean, a significant percentage you know, of the restaurants that, uh, that open up this year are going to fail. I mean, there, there are a lot of, a lot of tough businesses. Uh, I've always said, if you want to be regarded as a, a great business person, find a great business. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there's a huge difference. I mean, it does make a difference. I, I use this analogy. When, turn, I, when I got out of Columbia, one of my best friends was a terrific talent. And uh, he went to work in the steel business. And he did okay, but it was the wrong business to be in. It's very important to get on the right train. Mm -hmm. I mean, you want to you want to get on a train that's going to go 90 miles an hour, right. and not one that's going to go 30 miles an hour, and you're going to try to figure out how to you know, push it along a little faster. Right. So it, it really does make a, a huge difference. Uh, and and there are some businesses that are inherently uh, there's far more opportunity in mm -hmm. than others. So you want to give a lot of thought to what train you're getting on. And uh, I owned a half interest when I was, I don't know, 21 or 22, in a service station, uh, a Sinclair service station with a pal of mine in the National Guard. It was a lousy business. You know, we had a guy right next to us, and he kept selling more gallons of gas than we did. <laughs> he would cut our prices and everything. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't care if, you know, if you're a combination of Steve Jobs and Larry <laughs> Ellison and everyone else, you're not going to succeed if you got a guy selling gas below cost next right. to you. So, you know, it's important to get on the right train. And, and you really want to go to work for somebody you admire, uh, or a business you admire. I mean, mm -hmm. you're going you're gonna to do so much better. If you go to, if I'd gone to work for my friend Tom Murphy, you know, it would have worked, you know. Who knows what the first job would have been or the second job. But every, I would be learning every day from him. I, not only the mechanics of a business, I'd be learning how to, how to work with people, uh, you know. He would raise my sights. So you really want to be working for somebody you admire. If you're, if you're working for somebody that causes your stomach to churn, right. you know, Maybe you have to keep doing it, to, you know, to keep eating for a while, but don't don't settle for it. Okay, and and you know, you talked a little bit about you know your experiment with um, with the station. How do you? We have a question from Ismail from Fresh Meadows, um, and he's asking, how do you deal with failure, and what's your advice to young entrepreneurs like me in this case, especially with regards to failure and how to approach it? Yeah, well, if, if you if you fail, you really do dust yourself off and you know get right back mm -hmm. in. I mean. You're going to fail at some things. Uh, uh, you're going to have some human relationships that don't work out. Uh, you know, fairly significant number of people get divorced. I mean, and, you know, that's a very big decision to to have turn out badly. But uh, I think if you study almost everybody and read read Kay's book, you know, Personal History, and you'll everybody fails at some things. Right. I mean, you know, particularly. Particularly when you're younger, I mean, you know, you you do have less experience in evaluating humans, and you know, and and just knowing about whatever it may be businesses, uh, but you know, it, it it is not fatal. I mean, if you're healthy, mm -hmm. and you live in this, particularly living in this country, there's gonna be there's gonna be an opportunity that comes along. Uh, uh, 
I got turned down for the Harvard Business School uh, when I was uh, when I got out of the University of Nebraska. You know, and I remember, you know, I went to Chicago to get interviewed. This is when you traveled on the train, and so I spent ten hours going there. And this fellow looked at me, and about ten minutes, he said, "You know, forget it, Val." Oh, wow. <laughs> and, and now I've got to go back on the train ten hours and think, oh, what, no. "What am I going to tell think my dad? About it. What, right. I, what am I going to tell my dad? I mean, my dad always told me I could do anything. You know, and everything. Right. Now I've just got just gotten turned down. Uh, you know, but." It turned out to be the, one of the best things that ever happened to me because then I went to Columbia where Ben Graham was. It, in fact, I, I, it, it probably even affected who I married because I took a one-year course at Columbia instead of two years at Harvard, and she might have found some other guy <laughs> during that time. <laughs> and almost everything in my life that looked like a failure has either turned, well, usually it's turned into a success. I mean, it, 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 uh, the world isn't over. You know, it, uh, if you have bad luck in health, that, that's tough. I mean, right. that, there's just no, there's just no getting away. I've been lucky on that. But, but the other kind of things, if you're healthy and you're bright and you know, you've got decades ahead of you, you know, if something goes wrong, if you find yourself working for the wrong employer and they're, you know, they're doing things you don't approve of or they're not treating you fairly, you know, the world isn't over yet. You, know, right. you just go out and, and find somebody else. Well, thank you so much. I, on that inspirational note, is there what, what's the one piece of parting advice that you'd like to share with our members who are in the first 10 years of their careers? You know, just, just find your passion and remember those males around you, a lot of them have got a lot of the Wizard of Oz in them. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much um, for, for spending the time to sit with me and, and really answer questions from the community. And as you can see, that these questions keep coming in. We're not going to be able to get to all of them. But um, for those of you who are watching, um, you know, Mr. Buffett is kind enough to um, continue answering questions on his Lavo profile in the future. So if you didn't get your question answered today, uh, fear not. Um, there's still an opportunity. And we hope that you really benefited from this conversation, that you learned a lot. I, I certainly have sitting here. And um, tune in to this um, short video to understand how you can ask mentors questions. Thank you so much. And thank you, Caroline. Thank you. Have you ever thought, what exactly is a mentor? And where am I supposed to find these amazing people? Mentors are one part of the success equation, and Lavo is here to help. Lavo mentors have experience and insight from overcoming their own professional challenges and a passion for sharing their stories with you to help you elevate your career. Usually, the first step to getting a mentor is exchanging advice and building rapport. So we're thrilled to introduce a new feature called Ask a Question. Connect with the label mentor by clicking follow under their name and image. Request advice by typing your question into the ask box. You're welcome to make your question private, but we encourage you to keep it public because a mentor's answer to your question just might spark an aha moment for another member. Not ready to ask your own question? Just follow others and you'll still get great advice. You're a part of Labo. We're all here to help each other. Just ask and don't keep us to yourself. Share this video, invite others to join and feel the Labo love.